Good evening. My name is Jackson Vungani. I'll be your host tonight, whether you're joining us online or right here in our audience at InsecQ in San Francisco, home to Silicon Valley. Thank you for joining us. We are streaming live uh, tonight's event on Facebook. We can also, uh, we're also encouraging you to follow our conversation on Twitter, the hashtag for today will be beyond the unicorn. Now, the purpose of the event tonight is to screen our documentary shot right here in the Bay Area. As you will see, we later on in the documentary shines a spotlight on African entrepreneurs, techpreneurs, innovators right here in the Silicon Valley as they create innovative technologies that seek to provide solutions here in the U.S. and in Africa. Many of you know Africa is home to some of the most rapidly growing economies in the world. It's also said to be the youngest continent ever with over 60% of, of its population below the age of 25. The majority of the countries on the continent are on the verge of a tech-driven transformation. And I don't want to waste time. I want to get right into it, our program, by first inviting our VOA director, Amanda Bennett, under whose leadership VOA has made it its mission to tell these kind of stories, the kind of stories that kind of counter the narratives, some of the narratives about the African continent, that this is, uh, uh, you know, the, some of the stories that are usually in the Western media that can be reductive or dismissive of the great potential of African innovation. Uh, Amanda, is, Amanda Bennett, under whose leadership we've been doing this, Amanda, just a little bit about her. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who has worked for major media organizations like uh, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, and many others. Amanda, where are you? Let me uh, welcome and say a few words to our followers. Thank, thank you, Jackson. And on behalf of Voice of America, I'd first like to thank our host in CQ here in San Francisco. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, both the people here in this room in San Francisco and the people watching us in Africa and all around the world. Um, first, a little bit about Voice of America. Let, remind you, let me remind you who we are. We broadcast news and information around the world in 45 languages, 15 of them from the continent of Africa. And we have over 240 million viewers, listeners, readers. And just to put it in context for the people in this room, that's more than three times the amount of viewers, listeners, and readers of, from CNN, Fox, and MSNBC combined. And so what is our mission? Our mission is to tell accurate news and information in places that can't ordinarily get it, but it's also to tell America's story. And what is more American than the American diaspora, the people who come here from places around the world looking for something and looking to give something, looking to be someone? And what is more American than technology, the technological development, the robustness of our inventions, and what is more American than entrepreneurialism? The drive to create something new, to use our ingenuity to make something that has never been made before. So this documentary is actually a product of that kind of entrepreneurialism out of Voice of America. This, uh, our office in San Francisco in Silicon Valley has only been open for a year. So in order to encourage our journalists to seek out these American stories, our uh, Africa director, Ngozi Mnengsha, held a contest. And the contest was for the best ideas coming out of Silicon Valley. And the winners got to do those ideas. And the result is a story that I think would not have been told to the world otherwise. The story of these really amazing African entrepreneurs who made and created unicorns. So those of you who don't know, We'll find out what a unicorn is shortly. And thank you all, and I welcome you, and I hope you enjoy the documentary. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we wanted to also uh, extend our thanks to our host, uh, 
institution here today uh, in St. Hugh, and I wanted to invite uh, the director, Ron Morris, to come and say a few words before we get into our documentary. Thank you. Bonsoir, bienvenue, et vive l'Afrique. That is French for we are really excited to host this event tonight. I'd like to speak to you uh, a little bit about who we are, uh, also why we're excited about Africa, and why we're excited to have you here tonight. So InsecU uh, is 16 schools, 24,000 students across Europe. So we have campuses in Paris, London, uh, that's our uh, satellite campus, sorry, Paris, Bordeaux, Lyon, uh, Monaco, Geneva, Chambéry, and we also have three uh, satellite campuses. We have a campus in Shanghai, in London, and in San Francisco. Here in San Francisco, our mission is to give uh, our students the opportunity to come here and learn experientially, not about innovating, but by innovating. So they are meeting practitioners, they're constantly having guest lectures, and it's a very project-driven program. Um, our courses include um, design thinking, lean startup methodology, um, uh, growth hacking, and we also get them out of their comfort zone. We do this by, um, for those who are business school students, for example, they're doing uh, engineering, type, uh, pr uh, engineering type challenges such as coding and uh, 3D modeling. So why we as a French institution, why are we so excited about Africa? As we teach our students, we realize that a lot of our French speaking students are coming from Africa and notably our executive MBA program. This has 50% uh, African population, and they come here on learning expeditions to learn from people like you, people who have experience and insights to share. And as we learn from them, as we, uh, we, we see that they are very excited about the future. This, is, um, this enthusiasm is real, it is refreshing, and uh, it's very contagious. So we're excited to have you here tonight. Um, Hopefully some of you would like to share uh, with, uh, with our students coming over here. Our next cohort uh, will be in June. And so I invite you to speak with uh, Marianne Villa, our program manager and myself, about all of your interests. I've had, a, had the pleasure of meeting some of you already. And you're a fantastic crowd. I think we've got uh, a lot of things to share with Africa, a lot of things to gain from them, their enthusiasm, their, their, the fact that they're looking forwards. And, um, and a lot, to, a lot to share and a lot to gain from them at the same time. So thank you. It's a pleasure having Voice of America here and all of these panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. And so without much further ado, let's get to the business of why we're here today. Let's roll the documentary. come out here and you build something of great value, you can make it. That's what's amazing about Silicon Valley and that's why you see everyone flocking towards Silicon Valley. It's really that place where there's this groundswell of smart people dedicated to using technology to solve very difficult problems. I was like, oh my god, people just think of these things and it just happens and how can I build something? I just want to like build something from scratch. We come here ready to make something of ourselves. So when an African leaves Africa and comes here, we're coming here to do battle. Hi, my name is E, and I am Managing Director and Co-Founder of Flutterwave. And Flutterwave is one API for payments across Africa. Hi, my name is Jonas Beshaurid, CEO and Founder of Stackshare. Stackshare is the best place for engineers and developers to discover and compare software tools. Hi, my name is Bukola. I consider myself a connector. I build platforms to reach African audiences back home, as well as here in the U.S., to tap into their common interest. This is exactly what I've done with Jandis. Mall for Africa is an online platform that enables U.S. and U.K. retailers easily sell into Africa without any hassles or worries. We also help 
people in Africa purchase items from UK and US retailers without any stress. Mall for Africa started really with an idea. I was born and raised in Nigeria, so um, out of necessity, I guess, people, my parents and brothers and friends thought they could utilize me as their shipping company. There was one day in particular, I went to the airport and I had 10 suitcases. And I remember vividly, the lady across the counter was a Delta flight. The lady across the counter looking at me like up and down like, you are not serious. This is not gonna happen. So I decided to build an app. Jandus Radio started off with just word of mouth. Um, I sent it to a couple of friends who wanted to listen to live radio back home. We didn't have a uh, a lot of apps that were catering to African content and radio at that time. So I sent it out to them and they sent it to their friends. And before you know it, it actually was a trending topic in Nigeria on Twitter for like, I think it was 12 hours straight. People were talking about, oh my God, I have an app that has over like 300 radio stations. I'm in Abuja, I can listen to Beat FM. Beat FM is the most popular station in Lagos. And they're like, oh my God, I could never listen to this before. Now with this app, I can listen to my favorite station now. You know, I'm working on a platform product, which is payments, right? And I started digging into that and realized like it was an absolute nightmare to be a developer and get paid in Africa. I'll give you an example, like up until recently, if you were an Android developer in Africa, you had to put your apps up for free. You couldn't make money on your apps because there was no way for Google to pay you. We're not just enabling people the ability to increase revenue by providing them new means of payment. But we're also enabling them to access global technology services by doing so, right? That is revolutionary. The concept was, let's bring all of these tools that you use to build your company and your apps and infrastructure, let's bring them into one place and organize it. And other industries had done it. You know, Yelp has done it for restaurants, you know, TripAdvisor for travel and, and international places. So this wasn't really a new concept, but no one had really done this for software. If you think about it today, you know, where do you go for software decisions? It's still Googling around and it's mad. We were actually the first site to really do that. You know, there were other sites that were trying to do sort of similar things. They've done software reviews, but we were actually the first site to say, you know, share all the software that you're using. For an average entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, there are stages to what the venture funding cycle looks like. You have to start off with a seed stage. You have to be able to get people who believe in you early enough to take a risk in your idea. Every time an entrepreneur describes what they do, it usually has to hit the point of, I saw a problem, it was very unique. I had a solution, it was very unique. I was able to get, or I should be able to get somebody to pay me for my solution. But I should be able to repeat that so many times that it becomes scalable and sustainable. I know people who have joined a startup that thinks it's going to be the next big thing. just wake up one morning and they didn't get the funding around and it's lock up shop and that's it. Happens a lot more often than it's talked about. We hear about the Facebook and Google and Apple and 
all the other startups that are successful, but one out of a million succeed and the rest fail. Silicon Valley is probably the Disneyland of capitalism, is a good way to put it. It is a place where you can come and make your dreams come true and particularly in the technology space it's a really, 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 really a good ecosystem to get things done. Um, yeah, and of course part of it is venture capital, right? So people take risks here and you, you know, it's a place that is tolerant of failure. They're not looking necessarily for the steady company, they're looking for companies that will grow quickly. A lot of them will fail, um, they won't get their money back. Some of them will bring some money back and a small percentage of them will hopefully uh, bring a big return. The Draper Venture Network's mission is to be in all the places where interesting technology is being developed, where entrepreneurs are doing great things. Um, and right now, um, we have partner funds on all the continents except Africa. Um, so we're actively looking for a fund that fits the kind of profile we're looking for. They're investing in um, early stage technology companies. It's not an exact science. A lot of it's just character assessment. People who uh, are trying to build something bold versus like copying an idea in it for the long term, have the tenacity and ambition to see it through, uh, boldness, yeah. Definitely think e-commerce is a huge area allowing uh, Africans to buy products they couldn't otherwise access easily, particularly without having to build huge malls and you know, kind of leapfrogging uh, retail. Financial services is also, also a big area, fintech, anything around telemedicine, because um, you know, access to doctors is really hard in Africa. What everybody hears is you raise the 100 million, they say, yeah, but that's not success. Success is lasting long enough till you can exit, either through an acquisition or an IPO, and the money that the investors get in becomes liquid and fungible. So a lot of businesses I've seen don't make it out of the exit, and that means everybody gets washed out. You just spend seven, eight years of your life working on this thing that didn't pan out. The five or six most valuable companies on the stock exchange are technology companies that were once venture-backed. So it's a compelling story about how um, people that invest in high-risk ventures um, are able to um, move a society forward because they were willing to make the investment when those ventures looked, looked silly. Um, and one thinks maybe this could happen in Africa. We belong to the school of thought that, um, Af that believes very firmly that Africa's future will be built on the back of entrepreneurs. We are firmly rooted in bridging those knowledge gaps and making sure that the interconnectedness between Africa and the rest of the world comes in forms of capital, in forms of education and resources, and mostly its people and their ability to think and grow beyond what's currently attainable by using technology to flatten the, the, the playing field. A zebra corn is going to be a company that's built in Africa, for Africa, and skilled in Africa. It could become a unicorn by going beyond Africa, but made in Africa, scaled in Africa, so there's multiple African markets. And that's really what uh, distinguishes a zebra corn. So the first piece of code I wrote was my freshman year in college. I was like 16. I took Java and it was a program to like animate some radio and I was able to code it and I'm like, oh wait, it works. Like I just wrote code. I typed stuff and I ran it and it worked. I got thrown into mobile app development towards like 2010 where I created a, an app that went viral in Nigeria. Initially, it just started off as just radio and nothing else. So I said, what about news? What about gossip news, entertainment, sports, health news? Then I was like, okay, we can make this a little more social. What about having people interact on the app? 
I'd always been into tech, you know, growing up, I was like the tech person within our family, you know, people would always look to me. So I'd always been interested in it, but I'd never considered it as a real career path because I didn't have someone that I could point to that was in that industry. Everyone I knew was, you know, sort of outside of tech. I started to look at the internet as this space where it didn't matter who you were, but you were able to reach the most amount of people. Hey, good to meet you, I'm Mark. Mark Zuckerberg was my hey. earliest influence. Yeah. I've continued to be influenced by his approach to tech because it's the perfect mix of social mission, right, and economic impact. It's not about building a big company, and neither is it about being an NGO and giving everything away. It's about building a system. Introducing Mall for Africa, a rep. So let's say you are in a rural town in Nigeria. Download the app on your preferred device. Find the product you want. Once you've added it to the cart, you click on our pay button. And as they say, that's when the magic happens. We take the content from the cart. We put it in our environment. And now we allow you to select where you want to have the item shipped, how you want to pay for the product. Once you've made the payment for the product, the product is then shipped from the site you purchased it from. It's shipped to our warehouse. Then we tag it and then we ship it out to you, um, taking care of all customs, duties, fees, and making sure everything goes perfectly right. When I turned 25, kind of just reviewing the five years, I kind of settled on this vision of the world that was about building the future of Africa. And for me, it settles on three things. So it's a, it's a remarkably clear vision of what I want to do. And it's very simple. It's people, it's platforms, and it's policy. And Dello is a platform for tech-powered growth. Its future will be written in Lagos, Nairobi, and cities across Africa. And that was what we did at Andela, right? Found really smart young people who were very motivated um, with high learning agility, taught them, paid them while we taught them how to build software, and then got Facebook and Google and IBM and all these companies to hire them to build products for them. This is Andela. So what Flutterwave is, it's an API that enables anyone from anywhere in the world to process any kind of payment across Africa. We are finally making financial inclusion real. Every time I went to one of these hackathons, I'd see a new API and I'd think, man, I should know about that. Like, there should be this one online space that has all the best stuff and feedback from developers and engineers and people actually building software, you know? I was like, man, this should exist and I should just go build it, you know? And, and so I just treated it as a side project at first. Um, at the time, it was called Lean Stack. Eventually, I got introduced to um, this guy named Nick Grandy, and he was the first employee at Airbnb. So we started working together for about six months. We built out the first real version um, of Lean Stack at the time, and then he actually stayed on as an advisor, and he was the first investor. So, you know, that was big. We had a hosting company that had malfunction in their servers, and they deleted the whole database by accident and had no backup. Sadly, we had to shut down temporarily, but um, we're working on rebuilding. We believe the best way to solve this problem is to show you what the best companies in the world are using and why. The transition was it's like realizing that the best thing we can do is try to mimic an in-person conversation between two people, the two engineers, right? It's like, okay, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Oh, okay, well, we don't have good visibility into how our app is performing in production. Okay, well. Um, here's what we use, right? Like, here's how we solve that problem, right? And you tell them what you use, and then, like, <laughs> within 30 minutes, it's like, okay, I know that I need to use that now because I trust this person. I trust their decision-making process, and it sounds like a good one to go with, so let me go with that. I have a passion for creating products that I am interested in and that I'm passionate about. It's tough because, at the same time, you have to make a living. And being a startup founder, you don't always have the means to provide for yourself. I didn't have any of that, um, any serious investors. So after a while, I just, just to keep myself from not starving, I actually had to break down and actually get a nine to five just so I can provide for myself. I basically just kept at it because I saw the value of it and I saw that it was picking up steam. I, I could see 
it getting easier. So you typically wake up around 4.35 because that's when the first calls are. <laughs> My team all over the world, I try and talk to them as regularly as I can. I'll probably end around 12, only because I like to sync up with some banks and team members very early in the morning when they wake up. So it's, uh, it's a lot of work and not a lot of sleep. <laughs> Definitely, it's, it's a lot of work because the nine to five does take a lot of your time. But um, always in your free time, even if it's an hour or two hours a day that you can find, I'm always doing that. I'm working on something right now, um, you know, that I'm, I'm hoping is gonna uh, be very massively successful once I'm ready. You go to a venture capital in Palo Alto on Sanio Road and you say, hey, I'm trying to raise funds for my African company. And they look at you and they say, are people buying Ralph Lauren? Are people buying Louis Vuitton? Do they know who Prada is? So I think part of the challenge with the, you know, being black in tech is that there just aren't enough black people in tech. When you see all the big companies, they all have like co-founders that went to school together. And when you grow up with people that aren't in tech, you don't have the luxury of saying, okay, I'm gonna start a company and I know exactly who I'm gonna tag and, and bring in as co-founders or early employees. What role do networks play here in Silicon Valley? Um, I think it's a huge, huge role. It might be the distinctive of Silicon Valley, how over time these networks have grown cold call somebody or send a cold email to somebody and say, hey, I saw this thing that you did, and surprise, surprise, they respond. There's a lot of work that has to be done, the cultural preparation of what to expect in the Valley. And sometimes it's the most ridiculous, mundane, simple things. Punctuality at meetings, the way you approach people, email etiquette, business etiquette. It's the simplest things that have profound consequences within a cross-cultural scenario. Growing up in Nigeria, in, as an African in Nigeria, I have natural networks. I have cousins, I have brothers, I have classmates. I like to say I can get to the president in Nigeria, whereas in the US, I can't even get to my mayor. If you are not from here, it's very difficult for you to have a social network. You have to create that social network yourself. We want to make it... If you came into Silicon Valley and you're a well-trained research and development professional and you went to Stanford or UCSF and you were a specialist in what you do, you'll get a great job and you'll get well paid. If you came into Silicon Valley and you were of African descent and you knew nobody in the Valley, it would take you a longer time. In Africa, I'm an Igbo man. I don't even know that I'm black because everybody's black. It's like asking a fish what is water. Um, so Silicon Valley also has the aspect of the fact that it's about 3% black, which a lot of people don't realize until they get here. Where I work right now, I'm the only female mobile engineer. I'm also the only black mobile engineer. Um, it's not something that I expected. The culture fit is still a big topic here. You wouldn't think that people can refuse to hire you because you don't fit into a culture. It's happened in small ways where, you know, you go to a meeting with an investor and you can tell that they, they, they just don't want to hear what you have to say. And, you know, maybe it's your venture, maybe it's like what you're working on, but sometimes you can kind of feel that it's, it's just because of you and like your color and they're not even open to it. They just don't have to deal with people of color on a regular basis. From my perspective, I just brush it off and I'm just like, okay, you know, not for me, let's move on. If a company just invested time and said, look, we're gonna sponsor you. We're gonna provide your visa, your work visa, to come to Silicon Valley and work for us. You'll have this opportunity, but they're not, they're not going that route. And you have to ask yourself why. There's talent, these people are brilliant. One of the ways to solve that um, is just making sure that tech is part of that pool of options for us to make it the norm, right? Where when they see an African entrepreneur or you know a black founder, it's like, oh, that's normal. 
Hey, it's good. How's it going? I'm back since 95. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> How was the integration? Was it good? Uh, what you want to do as an African in the Valley is really plug into as many networks as you can. Yeah because that's ultimately kind of how you find the people who are ultimately going to root for your success. I definitely see myself doing this for the next, you know, at least five to 10 years. And I think anytime you're building a company, you have to be thinking long term. I'm also a realist and I know that if the worst happens, right, we get to a certain stage where it's like, look, you know, we've, we've sort of like exhausted all of our options and this is the best we can do with this thing. There'll be something else that I work on. I think the biggest impact that an African entrepreneur can have on Africa is to be seen, be a role model, be something and someone that people want to aspire to be like, be successful. Thank you, Eddie. All right. Apple actually has a woman of African descent. She's actually Ghanaian. That's one of their top people in marketing. Her name is Bozema St. John. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. I don't want to fit in. Because I feel like when you fit in, it, you don't stand out. Come on, y'all. I love the valley. But I only love it to the extent that I can establish these networks between the Valley and Africa that make Africa better. And I think that's ultimately the vision of Africa that, I, that we believe Flutterwave is going to enable. One, one Africa, starting with unified financial infrastructure. I'm doing seven figures, even eight figures a year. This is a really good idea and it's a good company to work with. My vision for Mall for Africa is bigger than Mall for Africa, it's actually Mall for the World. The vision is to help other emerging markets um, via a brand Mall for the World. And um, we've, already, we've already started doing that. We are sitting on a huge powder keg of potential in Africa. Over the next 20 to 30 years, more than half of the world's working population is going to live in Africa. It's the second largest continent in the world by size and by people. <laughs> I don't think there's any narrative of the world that is complete without Africa being a major part or player in it. For us, winning means being able to come back in 10, 15 years and say, technology changed Africa and you were in part of the, one of the greatest wealth creation, value creation opportunities in modern history. That's what we need. Okay. Hello? Hey, how you doing? Hi everyone, uh, since we last met, uh, we have made a lot of progress and done a lot of great things. We're under a new name called Mall for the World, which is same thing as Mall for Africa, but uh, outside of Africa. I have released a new app called Afrocast, and basically it's a podcast aggregator for millennials. So far we are in beta. Uh, we have over 300 users, so I'm really excited about that. We launched a new jobs platform that allows engineers to essentially find jobs based on the technology they're familiar with. We've had uh, our best month ever um, in terms of traffic. Um, we were also featured in Software Development Times, uh, online magazine uh, for engineers and developers. Flutterwave has been, has been doing really well. Since that time, we've more than 10 times our total process volume, so we do about 500 million dollars in total process volume and we do more than a hundred million dollars in total process volume every month come back to the west coast Africa, home to some of the fastest growing economies in the world. 
Seems everyone wants to do business here, especially Silicon Valley. There are plenty of opportunities, but also some major hurdles. We will explore in this panel discussion Silicon Valley and Africa, growth and challenges. Now here is your moderator, Voice of America's Jackson Mvungani. Welcome back. In case you're just joining us, my name is Jackson Vongani. We are streaming live from San Francisco in the Bay Area. Uh, and we just watched our documentary produced uh, by Voice of America, Beyond the Unicorn, uh, where we told stories, we saw stories of young tech entrepreneurs going through the hurdles, you know, facing the daily challenges of starting a business, uh, but creating solutions to problems. And... Um, telling their journey, however difficult it is. Uh, and we hope that that inspired you wherever you are in the world watching us today and watching them. We'll get to see them later on and have a conversation here and uh, hopefully create a dialogue, a continuing dialogue. But uh, one of the uh, our next phase right now before we get into the panel is uh, I wanted to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Ned Johannes, who's going to say just a few words, and then we'll get into our uh, the main part of our, our uh, discussion tonight. Ned, welcome. Thank you. Well, great. Th is, it is. Uh, well, great. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Nate Johannes. I'm the director of uh, artificial intelligence and intelligent cloud and IoT for Microsoft, specifically on corporate business development. And uh, when I was thinking about engaging this crowd, I, I realized that someone once told me here in Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area, that I'm the only person of color, black person, in this space right now. And I found that to be startling because I never thought about that way. Because when you think of uh, my sense of purpose, it stems from being a child of refugees from a country called Eritrea. And my family came here in 1984 after my father stepped on a landmine for freedom. And although he lost his vision, I still kept that sense of purpose to keep my eye on the site. And coming to the United States as a child of refugees, I understood that it's imperative to break through the barriers, but I couldn't rely on the guidance of my parents, not because of their intelligence, because of their access, not because of their access, because of the fact that they simply just didn't know. And as Jonas articulated in that video, it was my journey to leverage onto mentors where I am today. So my career has incubated in the halls of the New York State Supreme Court as an attorney, in the halls of investment banks as a securities lawyer, in the halls of the White House when I worked for President Obama where I met, you know, Alan, for example, and now in the halls of Silicon Valley representing the third highest market cap company in the world, leading the way around artificial intelligence. And when you think about what's the success, what's the secret of it all, how can we merge Africa to Silicon Valley, the solution is clear. We're the few and the proud. And it's imperative to relay information and understandings of what I've learned throughout the way. And when I saw this invitation, I saw my buddies, Stefan and Andale, it struck to the core of my heart. How did we meet? We were at a posh winery. I know Stefan likes expensive things. And Silicon, <laughs> in Silicon Valley, we met through a mutual friend. And I was not expecting to see two black people, especially two people from Africa, uh, uh, in the building. And immediately we kind of gave each other that eye, you know, like, okay, you know, what, what are you about? You know, it's kind of like, it wasn't like a get out look, but it was more of like, you know, <laughs> let's figure each other out. And you know us Africans, we, we started talking about business and what can we do together? And although we are in this beautiful winery overlooking Silicon Valley, the audience was understanding the landscape but as we looked east, our eyes may appear to look at the glaze of the, the hills of the valley, but we were actually looking at Africa. We were looking at ways that we could connect both worlds together. From that conversation, it stemmed the fact that our Microsoft Africa team met Andale in South Africa. Stefan brought 20 entrepreneurs to our offices where I introduced them to our venture capital team. We still yet to have an investment in an African country. We're going to change that. And it's imperative to keep that in mind bridging the vision between Africa and Silicon Valley together. But it's upon us. Because as we both know, these opportunities aren't going to relay. They're not going to fall in the laps of our parents or our network. It's going to fall in the laps of leveraging onto others' information, expanding other, other, other's, other's uh, sites, 
because the whole notion, your network's your net worth, that's real. And in Silicon Valley, you're either at the table or on the menu. You choose where. Whether you're an individual or a company, you know, Microsoft had to refine its way around how could it, how could it grasp around these young startups that completely disrupted the line of businesses for almost a decade. The CEO had to hit refresh. And at times, you know, we, we certainly think about in ways that we can engage the valley, but as a proud African, I make it my own duty, my own sense of purpose, to relay on what do I know, who do I know, how can I help you, so long as you pass the baton for that next Nate Johannes, for that next Jonas, for that next Andale, for the next Stefan. And so those are my remarks for today, and I certainly want to see how we can work together. Um, I'm best at LinkedIn. i got to catch a fight uh, to Seattle. Um, but uh, Nate Johannes uh, at LinkedIn, please reach out. And, and they can attest, uh, uh, I will try my very best to um, certainly uh, see how we can work together or invite you to our offices for free lunch. So thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nate. Thank you very much. Nate is quite a busy man. He has to go off and uh, take a flight. Uh, but we really appreciate the fact that he took time out and uh, come to, uh, share uh, his story with us today. And uh, we get into the final phase of our event tonight, which is a panel discussion with some of the people that you saw in our film, in our documentary. Uh, you saw uh, Jonas, you also saw his parents made a cameo, who they're also in the audience here. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember meeting you almost uh, 10 years ago uh, when you were starting out as, you were, I think, a graduate, uh, undergraduate student at University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Uh, we interacted a little bit. You had, a, a, I think, a part of a, an initiative called Harambe Endeavor, Young African Entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. in the early onset of uh, this whole Africa rising narrative where uh, we were, you know, young people like uh, Ned were trying to kind of, uh, kind of counter that narrative we've seen in the Western media about Africa uh, being uh, a continent of, uh, of, of disease and war. And, and for me, as a person who hosts a, a show on uh, Voice of America, who interacts with, the, uh, with, with people on the continent on a daily basis, uh, I, I found it quite inspirational. And, uh, you know, Jonas, I'm really, really proud of you. I just wanted to say that real quick, that I'm really proud of you. The other person that I interacted with uh, was uh, Steven Ozaigbo. I, I had you on a show two years ago, I believe, or last year. And uh, I want uh, to start off by asking you the question. Uh, I, I, for all other uh, members of our, you know, our distinguished panel, you can read uh, on uh, their bios. Uh, we have a little book that you can read up on them. But uh, I want to start off with you, Stephen. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your company does, your foundation does. But most importantly, is there such a thing as uh, uh, African technology? And then we can take the conversation from there. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, big thank you to the Voice of America crew. Um, this particular production has been a long time in the making, but it's even more important to point out how intentional that Voice of America has been in trying to ensure that the African narrative remains true. So uh, with the live streaming going on and with all of the, the ways that this particular broadcast will be reproduced across countries, across languages, I think this is very important to the African narrative. Our mission is simple. We, uh, we want to globalize African technologies, and we are globalizing African technologies. And to your question, yes, there is such a thing as an African technology, because to the extent that the definition of technology is making things better, then if you're making things better within an African context, if you're building for an African population, and if you're engineering towards a solution that's uniquely African, then yes, you have somewhat of an African technology. But even more important is the representation of what Africa is. For us, it's, it's a technology that could be built in Africa by an indigenous Afropreneur, as we choose to call them. But it could also be a technology that's built by, you know, folks who are diasporans are looking to solve problems back home. With the fourth industrial revolution, everybody's talking about what's going to happen next. Well, Africa is not going to play in the past. With the diasporan population we have here, with the wonderful people in this audience, we are very committed towards that future. And we know that if we provide the linkages, if we are able to build the bridges between Africa and the rest of the world, between young entrepreneurs on the continent and diasporans, between capital that sometimes is local and sometimes is global, and then between corporations like the likes of Google, Facebook, Voice of America, who are willing to engage a continent that used to be in the past, 
then certainly um, Africa will play a role in uh, the global entrepreneurial future. And that's our bet. Our bet is that it's going to be built on the back of entrepreneurs, period. And whether you're an entrepreneur doing tech or doing tech-enabled work, whether you're a social entrepreneur or whether you're an entrepreneur who's building out of frugality just from you know, the bare opportunities that you see, we work with everybody across that scale. Thank you very much. Um, Jonas, I'll get back, uh, I'll, I'll start with you again, uh, just to talk a little bit about your story, your journey, uh, when I first met you a couple of years ago, uh, um, some of the things that I see you doing right now, you actually kind of uh, envisioned at the time. How has your journey been so far? Uh, if you were to advise a young African uh, programmer, uh, who somebody, who, young entrepreneur who wants to start uh, a company, you know, young startup, what is your advice to them? Do they need capital? Do they need skills? What is the most important part of, of entrepreneurship? Heavy question. Um, so I think the most important thing is that you start. You know, I think a lot of people have this idea that there are certain things that need to be in place for you to be able to start a company. And um, I think that's that's just not true. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I started, I didn't really have much else other than an idea. You know, I had, you know, a loose network. I had some things going, but um, I didn't have capital. I didn't really know where to go. And so I think the most important thing is that you have something that you're passionate about and that you start working on it, right? I hear a lot of people talking about ideas and, and things they want to do, and there's a big difference between ideas and action, you know? And, and when we first met, actually, um, I was helping to start this organization called Harambe Entrepreneur Alliance. And um, at the time, it was that very concept. It was like, instead of just talking about solutions on the continent, let's get together a lot of people that are passionate about actually doing something, right? Um, and that's what we did. And fast forward to today, you know, over 200 entrepreneurs have gone through a program, um, including E from, from the uh, documentary, where when I first met him, you know, he was working on Book Nito. And uh, fast forward, you know, then he co-founded Andela, which then went out to raise over $80 million. And, and now he started Flutter Wave. And so I think the most important thing is that, um, one, we, we also, we all recognize that it's about people first and foremost. And then second, that we go through this process that we actually support each other, right? Um, and that's, that's why I'm actually happy to be here today is because I think that's one of the most important things is that we support each other and we have people that we can point to as successes. And, um, you know, we're all at different stages, but um, hopefully, you know, um, I, can, I can help the, the next person who's thinking about starting something. Right, because you said some, some, during the documentary, you said something to the effect that when you were starting out or when you were growing up, you did not have people that looked like you who were doing this. Yeah. Now, hopefully that when a young entrepreneur, a young, you know, person in, in, in a diaspora or on the continent is trying to do this, they will have a Jonas to look up to. Um, uh, Michelle, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, let, me, let me ask you, we, we just uh, had a, a news yesterday that uh, Google is helping about 12 startups uh, in their accelerator program, uh, I think in Nigeria, all over the continent. Mm -hmm. um, my question is that um, when these companies, these are big, some would call them oligopolies, uh, what would their, their incentive be to, to go to the continent? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, by way of background, I'm a corporate attorney here in Silicon Valley. So I work um, from the legal side helping startups um, both start and then also raise funding. Uh, part of my work, though, is also on the investor side. And what we're seeing, to answer your question, is an increase in corporate venture, where you're seeing giant corporations, especially in the healthcare space, um, in technology specifically, investing into startup companies um, for a variety of reasons, a lot of it being their ability to be agile and be able to innovate quickly and to use resources that may be a little bit restricted in a large company um, to achieve amazing things. 
Uh, the trend now to go into Africa specifically, I think a lot of it, when you're looking at the stat, um, the fact is majority of the continents under the age of 25, um, big consumers of technology. It's, I think it's not a question of if Africa is going to be the next wave of technology, but when. And I think from a point of view of Google and the big tech companies here, they're realizing that they either get on board or be left behind. And so I think in getting in front of it and getting in into these companies early on, they're able to, um, one, in some ways influence and, and shape what's coming out of the continent, but in a lot of ways almost get a sneak peek about what's coming, coming out from there. Mm. Thank you. And Dile, I, I, I'm, I'm coming to you last uh, deliberately because uh, <laughs> you're in a way kind of legendary in this space. Uh, for many of you who, who, do, who don't know him, I, I think you should read up on, on Andile Kaba. Uh, I'm not sure if I said your name right, right? You're getting there. Kaba. You're getting there. <laughs> You're getting there. Um, very instrumental in uh, drafting uh, South Africa's uh, telecoms uh, blueprint and uh, in the privatization of uh, telecom. Um, what would... Um, what would you advise African governments to do to, to attract or to help, to create environments that uh, help startup companies or young entrepreneurs? You, you know, if I can go back a little bit. In, in the early 90s, uh, before mobile came into both everywhere in the world, there was a cliche that people use in events like this, that there are more telephones in Manhattan than the rest of the continent. Mm -hmm. Now, think about how small Manhattan is, which would have more telephones than Africa. But today, we are proud to say that there are a billion mobile devices in Africa, which almost have been accumulated over a 20-year period. I think Africa has done extremely well, in my view. And apart from mobiles, I mean, we now see that those mobiles are being converted into becoming, you know, these multi-purpose devices to access big data and a whole range of things. I think, in my view, there are two issues that are critical that we need to do in the African continent, both from a policy point of view and as entrepreneurs. One, we need to create an environment to attract capital. We need to attract global capital. And I'll come back to that. And then two, we need to come up with policies that promote competition. Now, what do I mean by this is that we need to make sure that, you know, there is much more competitive play amongst those who provide services. That's the only way you can have entrepreneurs to almost thrive in that environment. If you have less competitive marketplace, then you have less entrepreneurial activity. So critical is that, uh, you know, governments need to open up markets and allow a lot of, uh, you know, African enterprises and others to play. Thanks that there's a decision in Kigali for a much more common market and, uh, you know, a trading environment that allows a lot of people to go in different parts of the continent. Mm -hmm. I think access to capital, and you can only attract capital if you create a conducive environment by putting a much more, you know, a good marketplace. I'll give you one example just before I stop. If you look at, there's a popular map of Africa that shows undersea optic fiber across the ocean. Now, when we started to build these optic fiber cables, people said, are you sure that there is going to be that much traffic out of Africa? Today, if you look, there are three, four cables on the Indian Ocean side and probably another three or four cables on, you know, the Atlantic side. All those cables, there's high-speed Internet traffic that connects Africa to, you know, America, to Europe, to Asia. And a lot of people are thinking of building more cables because of the growth of traffic inbound and outbound of Africa. Mm -hmm. So access to capital, it's important that, you know, if you look at, I mean, private equity, if you look at, you know, the share of private equity capital that's going into the African continent, it's still very tiny if you compare it with Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you're just joining us, uh, we are broadcasting, streaming live from San Francisco. We just uh, watched uh, our documentary, original documentary shot by the Voice of America Beyond the Unicorn that shows compelling stories of young African entrepreneurs in the diaspora. 
uh, you know, making moves here in uh, Silicon Valley. Now, uh, Stephen, another question that I have, have uh, asked you before is, what does it take to scale a company that, say, Jonas built here in the Silicon Valley and give it that global appeal, global reach? I mean, Jonas is doing the right thing. They're, there's, uh, there are folks who would uh, watch a documentary and tell you, I mean, I have a good friend, Collins, in Nigeria, who sa who's put out a paper that says, you know, he's not about the unicorn, he's about the African gazelle, right? So let's, let's, let's make it, first of all, let's make it a real animal, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's give it, that makes sense. Let's give it an African context where, to a certain extent, is, if it's a gazelle, then you're sure it will outrun, it would outpace, it would out-hustle, right? It would out-exist, right? But even more importantly, what are the metrics, right? A unicorn is a billion dollars, mm -hmm. right? A billion dollars within an African market, that's, that's Andile type money, right? When you're looking at, you know, <laughs> certain activities within, you know, uh, the startup world, then mm -hmm. you should be looking at tens, maybe even hundreds of millions, right? Mm -hmm. So that that way, there's something that's attainable if you want to put a brand behind it, so a gazelle. But even more so that there are markets that can accommodate that type of activity because um, the average startup in Africa at the point of seed investment, you find that they start having valuation conversations with investors that on both sides people don't even understand. You know, but the likes of Jonas being, having that privilege here, he already has an index to what that looks like, whether it's from the incubator that helped him, you know, spring up at 500 startups, mm. there are standards that are set for that. So that's one. It's the, the the first point is math, the simple math of it. But in trying to scale a company, uh, you will pivot, you will pivot, you will pivot, and you'll pivot again. You know, Jonas's name has pivoted. You know, just the name of the company alone. But then, as the wheel turns and the enterprise matures. It's up to him and his team to mature accordingly. He can't sit on what he built in 2010 mm. because someone will walk in and you know just slap him in the face. Then there's the exit. You heard about the exit a lot, right? Some companies build towards an exit. Some companies are building towards industries where they might be looking at being acquired or they might be looking at an industry trend that will favor them. In that particular scenario, you have to follow the trends. You have to be able to build accordingly. If you're going to build a team and have infrastructure. Right now, you know, there are no physical servers, it's all in the cloud. Right now, there are platforms like Yonas's that are making sure that more companies can integrate with them. You have to stay in tune with that technology because for a cloud platform, elasticity is just as important as the cost. If you take a lot of money into building out a platform that's way too expensive and it's not elastic enough to build according to the times, then you're in trouble. So the scaling issue is, is market-based, it's capital-based, it's technology-based, and it's also team-based. It's, it's up to Jonas now to surround himself with people who are way smarter than him right. um, to build out of the startup profile. Being a startup is a lot of fun. Being a company is putting big boy pants on. You know, paying taxes is a big deal. Right? <laughs> Having an accountant, you know, doing quarterly reports, those type of things, right? Getting your banker to show up at your house to draft a letter of credit, you know what I mean? Those things are real. And once you get out of start startup mode, mm. you start to look at that. You start to have lawyers that you actually have to pay, you know. Yeah, that's, yes, that's, we that's will the big be, boy stuff. They, we will be ex uh, taking questions uh, from the audience. We're also taking questions online. I already have uh, some questions uh, coming in online. Uh, but since we're, we're getting, you talked a little bit about the money, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, Jonas was able to raise uh, about $7 million for Stackshare. Uh, and, you know, obviously the million dollar question is that how did you, how were you able to pitch your idea to investors for, yeah. to, for them to get buy-in for the yeah, well, slight correction. The seven million was over the past since what? It wasn't in one three, chunk. Three and a half years, right, yeah. Right. So we just raised 5.2. But, you know, it all comes back to, I think, when people talk about, you know, it's difficult to raise money if you're a black founder, if you're African. Um, what I've always adhered to is that traction trumps all, right? And mm -hmm. what that means is that mm -hmm. if the numbers look good, if your product resonates, then there's not 
there's not really a whole lot of challenges. The challenge then comes when you're trying to sell the vision. So I always look at the process to raise the seed round, which was 1.5, to the process for the Series A, which was 5.2, and it was way harder to raise the seed round because I was selling the vision. I was like, hey, there's this thing called stack share, and you should you should invest, and they look at me, and they're like, uh, I don't know, but now it's just like you look at the numbers, right? You look at the numbers, and you look at the product. So I think that's the important thing to realize. And if you focus on that, then the money is like the easier part, right? You're just telling your story. And I mean, one bit of advice that I got, um, I think I read it somewhere, was that, you know, your job when you're fundraising isn't to go out and convince people to invest, right? It's to go out and find the people that already believe what you're trying to say, right? Um, similar to recruiting, right? You're not trying to like change someone's mind to believe in your startup. It's just like there's some things that you probably already believe and you're just searching for the people that have that spark. And, and those are the best conversations and that's ultimately how you know, I, I raise the money. All right, so how does uh, growth at this point look for you? What, what, what is, uh, if you're to forecast five years from now, how, what, where do you see StackShare? Five years. What, what will it look yeah. like? Yeah, five years what, from now. What will it take for the lawyer to come and you know have your documents signed at home? Yeah, no, we already we already have lawyers. Are you already there? <laughs> yeah, we already have lawyers. We get in early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very expensive. Uh, <laughs> but in five years, um, we'll, we'll look like a big company. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll have a bigger office. We just got our first office here in San Francisco, so. Uh, we'll look much bigger, and I think we'll be able to do far more than what we're doing now. I think we're just scratching the surface. When I look at our product now, I'm just like, man, it, there's so much work to do. So even right now, we're just like rebuilding everything. So five years, like, part of it is like, I don't know, right? But um, I do know that, you know, going along with um, this comment about pivoting, you always, you, you don't pivot on the problem, you pivot on the solution. So, you know, StackShare, the site, .io, StackShare.io, um, will look way different from what it looks like now, and, and so that's a good thing. Um, as far as the company, I think we'll be much larger and um, we'll, we'll be at a different stage. Thank you. Let's take a question from uh, the audience real quick. Um, I think he's got it. Oh. Uh, we have somebody in the behind. They will come to you. So my name is Fred, all the way from Nigeria. Um, basically, my question to the audience is, what can we do to ensure that we get the old monies in Africa to put in the startup, startup ecosystem? Because there are a lot of old monies, mm -hmm. but they don't see it as a place to, to take a bet on. So what do you think? Thank you. How do we get old money to invest in Africa? And that's, you know who that question goes to. <laughs> 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 Look, I, I think, I think, you know, to to make this environment succeed, you need an ecosystem. An ecosystem is composed of startups, VC, private equity, tech companies, you know, universities, and that's and broadly, you need that ecosystem to function together. You know, not one area to operate on its own. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we require in sessions like this to continue to create an environment whereby Africa has an ecosystem. I do agree that, you know, we need to create an environment whereby, you know, the FFF concept, family, friends, and fools can be able to invest in younger Africans who are starting up companies. Very good point, very important point. As to how really it should be done, I think uh, you know the programs that Stephen is having, which are focusing more on how to bring young entrepreneurs here. The recent conversations we're having is how to bring some of the people who can fund entrepreneurs so that they can come to the valley and understand how the ecosystem is here. So that they can meet, for instance, family offices, VCs, they can meet angels, they can meet different people who they will understand that, you know, yes, there is money to be made, there is an opportunity. So not only we must bring young people who are building startups, but we must bring people 
who are already successful in oil, in construction and others, so that they can come and see and talk to angel groups in the valley. Those are some of the things that, with my friend here next door, we are planning and hoping that such people will be able to come. Some of them have been coming quietly. We hope that that is going to increase to make them understand that, you know, charity begins at home. And I mean, to your, to your question again, uh, my good friend Tony, who was also in the documentary, he, he, he reminded the audience he's an Igbo man, right? The Igbo man in Nigeria who's in oil or in real estate, you tell him to invest in you, he points to the real estate, he says, you see that? I know how much rent I get. How much, how much is your startup going to give me, right? So investor education for us is critical because we're not only looking at bringing people into a new class of investments, we're also having to educate them on the risks, upsides and downside. And then in some cases, we're having to have them co-invest with folks who have been in the game. And that way they de-risk the conversation. Because in some cases, these guys have good intentions. You know, they, 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 they're children, they're cousins, they're, they're, they're seeing the likes of E and Jonas, and they, they want to have somebody in their family show up on a Voice of America documentary, right? <laughs> But then, at the same time, they run the risk of not knowing how this That's transaction good. will work, mm. right? So it's investor education at its core, but it's also creating a very clear risk assessment so that people know, if I'm going to invest 10% of my portfolio in this, I could run the risk of losing it all, so maybe I should do five or four or three, right? And then if I'm going to do it and I want to go into a game that already has been done, then maybe I should come to Jonas on his next round, right. tests with that, talk to a lawyer, you know, and see how that works. All of this comes together in that education ecosystem because you never know unless you know. We'll take a, another question real quick, but Michelle, as, as the lawyer on the panel, I just sort of wanted to understand from you if you were to advise uh, uh, a young entrepreneur who has a great idea. Uh, these people say that there's a tendency for young entrepreneurs when they have a great idea, all they're looking for is the money. Uh -huh. uh, and at the end of the day, they find themselves uh, either selling themselves short uh, or, you know, entirely selling their companies uh, or their ideas uh, to these big, you know, bigger companies or, you know, big lenders. What would you advise them to educate themselves on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of times when people come to our offices at, at law firms, they come in at two points. One, when they've been sued and they're in trouble. Or two, because an investor told them, you need to come to see a lawyer. Um, very rarely do I have proactive entrepreneurs who are like, hey, I want to spend a lot of money on legal advice right now. Um, I, don't, I don't know why. That seems like a great idea to me. But I think the one thing that I always try and counsel entrepreneurs on is to think, like you just said, bigger than just the investment. Mm -hmm. Because especially at the early stage, um, investors are looking to invest in the team and into the idea. Um, and, and, and so far, you know, a lot of times what you can show them by being organized in the way you keep your corporate documents, by being organized in the way you think about the regulatory landscape in the area that you're trying to um, grow and, 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 and build in, is that you are thinking long term, that you are building a company and not just just you're trying to sell out right away and make a quick buck. And I think the way to show that and demonstrate that is to think deeper about some of the issues you're going to run up against. Because there are, there are, you know, especially Africans, we're very um, idealistic as a people, our culture, the way we, there's everything we do. So we're not short on great ideas, but it's in terms of turning those ideas into actual viable solutions and where you're going to run up, especially in the U.S., is in the regulatory scheme, the legal scheme that you can get um, caught up in if you're not careful at the outset to set out a vision that can work with whatever landscape that you have to navigate down the line. Okay. You no, just a quick one. I think it's very important that when you are an entrepreneur, try and find a mentor. Yeah. I mean, try and understand what business coaching is because sometimes money is important, but mentorship is as equally important as the money. To get to talk to someone who has walked the path before you and who can guide you and show you because some of these problems or challenges that you experience are not in any textbook, are not in any business school. You will only be able to get them when you talk to somebody, when you find a mentor in your journey from seed right up to series A mm. or even up to exit to keep, keep a mentor when you are running 
a startup. It's very, very important. Jonas, you wanted to add something on that? Yeah, quick shout out. Is Salchuk here? All right. Well, your, your, your mentor is he's one audience? of my mentors. Yeah. So <laughs> I was just going to say one of the things that helped me as I was going through, you know, fundraising, hiring, all of that was just having him as a resource. And so he started a bunch of companies. He had done it before. And so I was able to, you know, really lean on him for all types of advices. And I can't express like I can't stress how important that is when you're really going through it in fundraising. You need someone you can just like text like, hey, this email was crazy. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You know, like you need someone you can you can have those cycles with. So and I was fortunate enough to be here where there's all sorts of people that have done it before. You know, so I think that that's critical in the early stage that you get someone that you can really go to for small and big problems. Mm. You know? And, and, and uh, that's also another big problem that I've, I've had from uh, young entrepreneurs, either in the diaspora or on the continent, that uh, there's uh, uh, a tendency by, uh, you know, people who have been around to not take them under their wings. Even when they go to their offices, they knock and people, you know, they're like, you know, stay away from me. Uh, but we'll get to your question <laughs> real quick. Um, What's your name? Introduce yourself and then ask the question. All right. My name is Edwin Edebury, and I'm the chief happiness officer of the Happy Neighbor Project. I know you guys will say, what's happiness got to do with technology? So that's a different story for another day. But for now, though, a lot of the conversation that I hear talks about the exit problem. And I've heard it so many times, you know, the exit strategy in the African situation. So my question is two parts. First of all, is that really critical? Are we trying to apply Silicon Valley strategy to African situation? And if it is, then how do we solve it? Um, I think I'll, I'll let Andy Lay speak to the broader piece of it. But from my side, is it critical? Oh, absolutely, yes. As an investor, if you give me money, you want your money back. And that getting your money back is either through a liquidity event that says, I give you exactly what you gave me or through a higher liquidity event, which could be an exit, where I give you back what you gave me in a multiple. And those activities there means that it's not a Silicon Valley thing. Uh, to your question, or to your point earlier about our cultural ways, you know, it's not uncommon for us back home for a cousin to say, bro, give me five dollars, or give me five naira, or give me five, you know, shillings. And that's a loan. If I gave you five shillings for three months, you shouldn't give me five shillings back if the interest rate in the bank is 12% at the very minimum. But if I gave you that at a 0% interest, then I expect five shillings back, right? So if you're a company and somebody gives you money, if that person is your cousin, your father, your sister, at the very least, you should give them their principal back. So it's not so much of an exit in terms of an exit activity, like an IPO. Sometimes the exit could be that you were acquired by another company. And there's a liquidity event there. Sometimes it could be that there's an investment money coming in and that person can sell their shares and get a higher order by the multiple on the shares. So it's not a Silicon Valley thing. It's, it's more of a straight line financial thing where for every dollar you give me, for every Naira you give me, for every Kenyan shilling you give me or South African Rand, you want to beat inflation as an investor. You want to make sure your money is protected and you want to have a return at the very least of your principal. If those three things are not in place, forget about exit. Just give me my money back, you know. Yeah, I, I think, um, look, we, we, I'm in private equity. <laughs> when you're in PE, you, you invest. And at the time of you, you get into the business, you think about exit. I think the South African, the African market, you, you need to have that liquidity. That's the only way that you can attract foreign investments. You can only attract foreign investment if people can see that there are liquidity events that are regular in the market. That's the only way. I mean, and therefore the minute there are no liquidity events in the market, then it becomes a problem. I mean, that market will end up being stagnant. You know, the only way people are able to invest in anything is because they know that I can get my money out. So yeah, Liquidity is very important. Exit is very important. So the second part is how do you solve that? Because that's not really showing right now in the continent of Africa. So how do you solve that? You, you, the way you would solve that is 
to ensure that, I mean, I can, I don't want to take too much time, you, is, is going back to the whole ecosystem. Once you have entrepreneurs, different VCs, and, you know, angel groups, and PE funds, you know, as the business migrates, it grows, it will probably start as something that angels have an interest in or family members have an interest in, but as you go to different series, you will have institutions interested in it, other people reduce and they exit. And then as it grows, you then have, you know, this business maybe will attract PE funds and family offices mm -hmm. and institutional funds. So other people exit as the business is growing. And then ultimately you list it in, you know, in Nairobi or Lagos or Johannesburg, you know, or, or, or Cairo, depending where you want to list your company. But we have to make sure that this process of business must happen. Did you? Yeah, I mean, to, to your question about how do we do that, I think part of the solution is what you see up here is like people that are outside of the continent that have access to capital, that have access to the networks, bringing that to entrepreneurs that need it, right, mm -hmm. in Africa. And that, that's sort of the idea behind Harambe Entrepreneur Alliance is how do you create these networks? Because, you know, he's a great example of this where, you know, his company Flutterwave is based in Nigeria, but he went through an accelerator that's based in San Francisco or uh, Mountain View, right? So creating those linkages, I think, is, is a step in the right direction because you lower, you lower the risk, right? It's all about risk. If they don't know about ventures in Africa, there's not going to be a whole lot of activity, a whole lot of investing. But once they start hearing of the flutter waves of the Andelas, like then they start to get familiar with the, the idea of Africa. And then it's, it's just a slow process, right? But I think that our role is to help create those connections, both through introductions and just helping mentor folks that are going through um, some of those challenges. Right. If you're just joining us, this is the Voice of America. We are broadcasting from the Silicon Valley. Uh, our distinguished panel of uh, entrepreneurs, of uh, lawyers. Uh, Stephen, wh what do you usually call yourself when, uh, how do you introduce yourself? Ex bank robber. Ex bank <laughs> Uh, we are taking questions online. Uh, remember, uh, if you're tweeting, our hashtag is Beyond the Unicorn. Uh, we will uh, be uh, streaming for the next, I uh, think, 20 minutes. Uh, so, you know, get onto it, ask questions. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity to be able to, to hear from people like Jonas, whose journey is quite inspiring and interesting and still starting in the early phases. Uh, we're interacting with the audience right now, but we're not forgetting you online, so we, we have a gentleman in the audience who has a question. Right. Um, my name is Elias Mohammed. I'm a financial advisor with uh, Merrill Lynch. So in the documentary, uh, getting to the end of it, it showed um, black participation in you know, tech in the Silicon Valley, 1%, 2%, <laughs> and all of that. Very, very disappointing. So this question actually goes to Jonas and other entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley. What are you doing to help other Africans, other blacks, you know, in terms of recruiting to get a fair representation in the Silicon Valley? Well, first, first answer is if you know some, let me know. Because, you know, <laughs> the, the part of the real challenge there is that it's a numbers game, right? So if, if we're looking at, we're hiring, by the way, engineers, designers, PMs. Um, <laughs> Wait, repeat part of, that. People want to hear that. Yeah, no, we're hiring. Stackshare.io <laughs> slash careers. Um, part of it is that we, we're looking for folks, right? So that's, that's I think, the best that we can do. Um, we also support an organization called Hack the Hood. You know, we did an event with them um, where they're trying to make sure that more underrepresented uh, minorities can get into tech. So um, we're doing what we can, but I think ultimately it comes back to, like, getting addressing it at every stage right so making sure that there are more of us in tech and and that can find these opportunities but you know i always tell people it's not really you know no offense to the big companies it's not really going to be the big companies to solve the problem we just got to go out and start our own companies and 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 do it that way right so that's you know i don't have a, a silver bullet but we're we're hiring so i have a silver bullet still I have has a, a silver bullet. i have a silver bullet I have twin boys, so if you make more children, 
<laughs> it doubles. You put a computer in front of it. It's a population game. People, pay attention. I'm Make more children is a population game. But even more importantly, it's... I'm trying. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> Evidence. Put our beautiful black women to help us. And for the guys there, build young black men and women who would look at entrepreneurship as a path. Because I think another thing we have to look at is our ability to demystify entrepreneurship. I am, I'm born and raised Nigerian. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a career track in Nigeria that is doctor, lawyer, accountant, or something, anything else but entrepreneurship, right? So we know that that's a thing. But uh, to Jonas's point, if you're hiring, yes. If you're going into historical black colleges to hire people, yes. If you're making sure that diversity is part of your, your hiring policy and your hiring pool, yes. And if you're encouraging your children, your cousins, if somebody comes to you from your family and they have a crazy tech idea, tell them to find a mentor. Make sure you speak to them once a week or something, but don't just tell them they're crazy because they may be the next stack share. Right. And, and you know, uh, Andile, you, you, you wanted to add on to that, but real quick, I wanted to ask you as a person who has, uh, you know, one, one of the visionaries on the continent uh, in technology, uh, what are some of those uh, low-hanging fruit ideas that are people kind of overlooking? Uh, now, you know, somebody will say, stack share, I've never heard of that. I would never even think of such an idea. But there are obviously other ideas on the continent that, would, uh, th that young would-be entrepreneurs should be thinking about. What are those? I, mean, I think if, if you, you, I mean, I think the stack share model to me is the true success that can change the African continent. I mean, I think the data, it was mentioned here, the fact that 25% of the world's millennials will be in the continent in the next few years. I mean, it's, it, I, I, I mean, Stephen might say it, you know, it's a numbers game. I mean, in my view, we need to build the skill of data scientists, data engineers, data analytics. That is where the future is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to build that capability today I mean, put it like this, if you look at whether you call it the unicorns, I mean, the 10 or 20 companies today, I mean, uh, you know, from Apple to Google, Facebook, etc., and you aggregate their, their market cap, and you look at the numbers of people working there, and then you look at the GDP of this country, you will realize that the way the future is going to be is that our industry is almost going to be 50% of the global GDP in the next 10 to 15 years. And unless we train young people in data science, in AI, in blockchain, in machine learning, in deep learning, in meta learning, that's the only way we can position ourselves mm -hmm. in the global landscape. It is to scale people from when they are young, you know, we need to therefore look at our education system, we need to look at our high schools, middle schools, we need to look at all that. Mm -hmm. And try and build this cohort mm -hmm. of people who are going to be part and parcel of this digital fourth industrial revolution. Of the new frontier. Exactly. I mean, it's got, I mean, the good thing with it, it's all knowledge. You don't have to have you know, if you know how to code, if you understand Python, if you know how to build your own algorithms, you will be taken. You will work, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Mm. You might be sitting in Kigali, or you might be sitting in Mombasa. If you have that capability, you will then have your own platform and your sandbox sitting in GitHub and be able to be recognized whether by people anywhere in the world who would then access your knowledge and skill? Yeah, well, shout out to Andela because, you know, that's what they're doing. They're training software engineers and you don't have to go through formal, you know, get a university degree. That's what's beautiful about their model. You know, he, he co-founded Andela and, you know, that idea is amazing because the, we have those here. Right. Like there's all sorts of boot camps like it's it's gone through a whole cycle. Right. Like and the fact that you now have an African example, I think, is powerful. And 
ultimately that's what it comes back to. We need more builders, we need more creators and people that are that are in the industry. How how uh do you overcome that first fear uh when you're starting in, you know, when you're putting in, you know, when, when uh you have the idea obviously but then uh, somebody would say, I, I, tr I almost tried, but I did not because I was scared. How do you overcome those fast jitters? Maybe Michelle. Uh... I mean, I think a lot of it, especially being an African woman in this space, mm. um, it's, it's hard to do something when you haven't seen it done before. And I think a lot of what you're doing by nature, by being an entrepreneur, especially in tech, is you're going to uncharted territories. I think it comes back to something that was said before, is to surround yourself with people who have at least gone before where you want to be. And you can see a model of it. It may not look exactly like how you are wired or how you, or how you want to be, but it at least gives you a picture of what's possible. And the one thing that I love to see about entrepreneurship, especially for minority when we're working with, when we see kids that come alive, is, you know, I mean, I call it the Black Panther phenomenon, right? Like, now that people have seen that a movie can make, raise a billion dollars in the box office, the number of kids now that want to be the next, you know, directors right. that raise that is going to go up. The number of kids going to be named Wakanda is going to go up because now they see <laughs> that it's possible to do it. And I think part of it, especially going back to the earlier question about the importance of diverse representation, is to have more visibility to men and women, especially, who are doing what you, what you want to do and, and exposing. Um, that's why I love what the African Technology Foundation is doing exposing entrepreneurs in Africa to what's going on in the valley. So even if they don't look exactly like you and they don't have the same skin color as you, you know that, okay, no, that's possible. And I have brains. You know, in Nigeria, they say, do they have two heads? You know, you know, I can do that too as well. Um, so I think that's probably one of the biggest things just to see it. That's fear, fear, fear is notional. It does right. not exist. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to convince yourself that there's no... Yeah. <laughs> Let's take, I think, a last question uh, from this gentleman and then, because we have a uh, two minutes. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, um, I wanted first, um, sorry for my English, I came, I'm coming from uh, French. It's okay, we can, hear, we can hear you, we can yeah. understand you. So I wanted first to clarify your view of Africa because Africa is about mm -hmm. 54 countries and <laughs> 24 of the countries are French-speaking country. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I know that uh, I was in Africa. I know the work uh, uh, Voix de l'Amérique, VOA, is doing in Africa. The Voice of America is doing uh, a great job. But still there is uh, a big challenge for African businessmen to go in Africa because there is a real language barrier. Those 24... Wait, Sorry, yeah. R wrap it up. Those yeah, 24 uh, countries, they are speaking French, and they are like disconnected to this reality here. Mm. Mm. And you can see that in the movie, in the documentary, they are talking about only Zambia, and Nigeria. Africa is not only Nigeria and Zambia. Africa is Congo, is uh, is uh, Burundi, yeah. Mali, many countries. It's about 400 million of people in 20. Uh, 2017 uh, statistic. So my question now is, what is your plan for the, those French-speaking countries? Excellent. Uh, you know, we're actually running out of time. I know we haven't scratched the surface. Uh, I'm getting a cue that uh, we need to wrap it up. Uh, we will, you know, have conversations offline with uh, our panel, distinguished panel. But I wanted to, before you know, I get cut off uh, cameras. I wanted to. Thank all of you for coming and for joining us online. If you joined us online, thank you also. And thank you for coming, coming. And a special thanks to our panel of uh, distinguished entrepreneurs, founders, lawyers. Uh, you can follow them. Uh, you can have a conversation with them. They're very accessible. And thanks to everybody who made this happen. Thanks to our filmmakers. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, French question. Uh, so, 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 so the, the last, the last part, the last part, the last part. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Guys, Jackson, I'm coming to just again. Yes, 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 yes. Jackson, can we take this question? Yes. Can we take the question? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. All right. So we'll we'll take the question off camera. Yeah. And then after that, that we'll yeah. have uh, we we still right. we still have to. Uh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen. No, no, no. They they they, 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 they,